they're testing things up, upstairs, I think. So in, while they're trying to get that set, um, I just want to thank uh, Elise for, oh, all right, uh, for organizing all this uh, and giving us the opportunity to summarize what, we, what uh, we've been working on for the last uh, several years. Uh, and we're going to shift gears a little bit. Mark and Manolis gave you a, a great sense of what you can do by taking all the data sets uh, that the different labs have been generating uh, and, and how you can make sense of it. Uh, I'm going to, okay. I'm going to uh, tell you, we're going to get down in, uh, into the trenches here uh, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what data really was generated, uh, how it was generated, and some of the things we've learned about it. So if I can move this up here, maybe not. Good. We're back. OK, maybe. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm going to try to tell you about uh, what we're learning about the transcriptomes of both fly and worm. Um, these are efforts that uh, on, have involved basically long and short RNAs from both flies and worms uh, from our group uh, of involving several different labs, Fabio's group, uh, Sue Selnicker's groups uh, with Eric Lai and Brian Oliver, and uh, analysis helped with uh, Manolis and, and Mark. So the, the idea, uh, both worm and fly genomes were reasonably well annotated at the start of the project, but for instance in worm, about half of the transcripts uh, really had no experimental evidence uh, in 2007, uh, despite the uh, very significant uh, efforts at capturing cDNAs and, uh, and directed uh, studies by both uh, Mark Vidal and, uh, and Yuji Kohara and others. And so our, our, our idea was that we were going to do uh, RNA-seq, uh, proteomics, uh, and, and some directed studies as well uh, on a whole uh, variety of different stages, figuring that some, uh, some things had been missed because they, they only occur at particular times or they're pretty rare. We, we wanted to look very deep. Uh, we also wanted to be able to capture particular cells uh, and tissues from the worm, and for that, uh, David Miller uh, has been working on methods to isolate uh, fluorescently labeled cells uh, by fax, and then uh, we've been making our RNA uh, seq libraries from them. And, and similarly, uh, Sue's group in flies uh, looked at, uh, again, uh, RNA seq across uh, development, uh, various, time, various times in, in development. They've, looked at cell lines, uh, they've looked at particular tissues, they've chopped off heads and pulled those and, and, uh, and done different conditions uh, and looked at RNA binding proteins. Uh, and just to give you, this is all, we're now trying to see what we can do in context uh, of, the, of the landscape of the, of the transcriptome compared to human. And uh, with, so we're, we're uh, also trying to uh, work with Tom Gingeris. Uh, they've collected a massive amount of data uh, from different cell lines. Uh, you can see down here, there's, that's, that represents a billion reads uh, for each of these different cell lines uh, under a diff whole different bunch of conditions. Uh, and so there's a, a huge amount of uh, uh, data available in human. In terms of what we've actually produced in worms, this, this gives you an idea. We've looked at 106 different uh, samples from uh, embryos, uh, roughly uh, replicates from uh, samples taken every 25 minutes apart, uh, different, life, different uh, other parts of the life stage. Uh, we've also looked at four different species. We've treated worms with pathogens to see what kinds of things we can be induced on, under those conditions. And with David, we're looking at different tissues and cells. Similarly for fly, uh, cell lines, tissues, treatments, uh, poly A tail enrichment, the developmental time course. Uh, whoops, that I didn't do. Uh, and, and just lots and lots of data. 
Uh, you can see Sue's group has uh, generated more than 12, uh, 12 billion reads uh, here, and uh, I don't know how many, uh, how many, how many nucleotides that, that reads. What have we learned from all this? Um, well, we're, what we get are, from the RNA-seq are parts. We get, uh, we get splice junctions, we get coverage of exons, we get, uh, in the case of the worms, we get splice junction, I mean, uh, splice leaders, poly A tails, and then we have to put them together. And sometimes uh, it's fairly straightforward. Here's an example where uh, the, the gene structure is pretty simple. There's just this one alternative splice. There is an alternative five prime end as evidenced by different splice leaders in the worm. Uh, and then different uh, three prime UTRs based on the poly A, poly, different poly A signals we get. These are the intron, uh, these are splice junctions basically. And so we can reasonably put together a model like that. But sometimes it gets harder uh, where you get too many different signals. Uh, the, trying to put all these pieces together gives us some uncertainty about really how many transcripts there are. We'd love to have uh, technology that would give us uh, millions of or billions of uh, three, three to five KB reads or something like that. We could actually get this straight. Uh, but this is from Fly, from Ben Brown's work, where they're trying to uh, sparsify and, and yet represent all the different uh, signals that they get. And then you come up with really hard ones, and we're doing our best guess as to what's going on in, in, in those. Underlying this, of course, we have evidence for each of these different elements. It's the, common, it's the combinatorics uh, that we, don't, we, we only can infer. But with this uh, kind of thing, we've uh, been able to significantly improve the gene models. Here's one uh, where we started out uh, that with genes uh, going, four different genes uh, in, in worm base. Uh, with our data, we, can, we see more than one transcript for this and more than one transcript for this with, uh, with alternative five prime ends uh, here, for instance. Um, Whoops, I lost this. Okay, I lost the slide. Uh, no, 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 I'm all right. Okay, uh, anyway, so what happened is that these uh, two genes actually merged, uh, and these two then in turn merged with that one. Uh, and. Uh, and this is high, well supported uh, by the underlying evidence. So instead of four genes, uh, we actually end up with two in this situation. Another example here is uh, something we, we saw both in worm and fly quite a bit. Uh, the gene model started out, a, the, most of the body of the gene was okay, but uh, we found additional five prime exons or three prime exons uh, in, the in this case here for one of the fly genes. So uh, significantly uh, altering the, the, what you think might be the promoter region. Here is, we also find uh, long coding R, uh, RNAs. Uh, here's an example from the X chromosome on worm where this block here represents the, the longest open reading frame we could find in this gene. Uh, it's about 4 KB altogether uh, with splices and some, alternative, some evidence for alternative splices. Uh, and so we've been finding and adding uh, to, to these kinds of features uh, throughout the genome. So when you take all that together, uh, where do we stand? So with the worm, uh, these were the numbers that we started out in terms of the different elements and we're pretty confident uh, of those. Uh, worm base had 105,000 splice junctions, only 70,000 of those were supported by evidence. We now have 131 uh, splice junctions that we've incorporated into transcripts. Uh, we have more if we look for rare, uh, rare splice junctions, we're, but we're ignoring those for now. We have a lot better sense of what's the start and stop of genes. Uh, we have lots more exons. And in particular, uh, we have uh, added to the gene count. Some, we, we suspect a lot of these are non-coding RNAs at this point, but, uh, but 
uh, there are uh, multiple uh, genes that appear to be coding from the mass spec data. And we've increased the number of transcripts some, some fourfold. Similarly, in the fly, uh, you have a, a, another comparison there. Again, uh, more splice junctions, uh, more, more exons. Uh, and again, uh, about, uh, in this case, about threefold more transcripts uh, than, were, than were represented in, uh, the, in fly base. All this has uh, changed the landscape, uh, our view of the genome a bit. Uh, here in, uh, from fly, you can see uh, that this is the intergenic distance uh, represented in, uh, in fly base 5.32, uh, and this is the intergenic distances uh, after, uh, after taking into account the mod encode data. So uh, we're encroaching uh, and reducing the intergenic space. Similarly, if you look at the worm, uh, if we look at the number of transcribed bases, uh, it was 28 million uh, in, uh, in uh, worm base 230. Uh, it's, we've got about 37 million bases uh, with, ev with good evidence of transcription. So that's changing uh, things con considerably. Now, can we compare this worm and fly and look at this landscape now with respect to human? And so we're going to use human uh, gen code uh, which is a combination of Havana and Ensemble. Uh, we're going to take the mod encode data from uh, June 15th and the worm data from the same time. And so the number of loci, worms, uh, uh oh, PowerPoint has encountered a problem. <laughs> uh, gee, that's a. That's too bad because it was going to be a, a pr pretty good punchline. Worms are going to have more genes than, uh, than people. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's hope this works. All right. Sorry about this. I'm sure this is coming off my time too, right, Elise? <laughs> let's see where we are. It's slowly waking up. Okay, we're about, I got about the right place here. We'll back up a little bit. It did it again. Oh no, here it goes. All right. So protein coding genes, uh, it looks like here anyway, uh, worms are slightly ahead of, uh, of humans. Uh, flies are down still about 15,000. Uh, these are our estimated protein coding genes, but humans have still lots more transcripts. The transcript uh, landscape for, human, for worms and flies has increased dramatically, uh, but, but humans still have uh, many more transcripts. And in terms of exons, uh, humans have many, many more. And, and from Tom's work, uh, they have evidence for some 40,000 additional genes, 94,000 other exons, and 73 other transcripts. These are probably uh, mostly uh, non-coding RNAs of various kinds and at various levels. Uh, but this is the comparison with uh, the, the current view of, uh, of human. In terms of numbers of, non, of uh, long uh, non-coding RNAs, you can see, uh, again, human has many more, uh, and so there's, not, there's uh, still considerable difference. And in particular, well, you could worry about those kinds of comparisons because we're using different methods and, and we're trying to put together things in different ways. But here is uh, the human pseudogenes uh, processed in all, uh, and versus the fly and worm pseudogenes processed in the same way. Uh, and you can see human, uh, humans have a huge number of processed pseudogenes, we knew that, uh, and a bunch of duplicated pseudogenes. Uh, worm has uh, maybe 1,100 of these, uh, fly has about 500. So a huge difference uh, in, the trend, in, the, in the transcriptional landscape between the three organisms. 
Okay, so what can, I want to give you a, few, a couple anecdotes at the end here about what we have been able to do with this. As I mentioned, we've been collecting data from uh, different stages of the life cycle for both worm and fly. Uh, and Jessica Lee uh, in Stephen Brenner's group, working with Stephen, asked the question, can you find genes that are associated with specific stages in one organism and see if those are also, uh, are they associated with particular stages in the other organism? And so to start out, you have to find, uh, these are the different uh, data sets that, that uh, were available. And to start out, uh, Jessica defined the stage specific, uh, or the stage associated genes, and then looked across uh, different stages within fly. And it's not surprising, you get a nice diagonal. And adjacent stages uh, share some of those same genes. Now these are just looking at the orthologs, of, of course. For worm, you get a similar picture. Uh, again, a strong diagonal, and then, so the question is, what do you get when you compare worm with fly? And quite satisfyingly, uh, there is a strong diagonal here, uh, so especially uh, in the embryo through the embryonic stages. Now, to make sure you understand what we're talking about here, I want to I want to explain how Jessica got uh, the significance of uh, this one score. So. She started out, as I mentioned, looking at worm fly orthologs for each organism. She then looked to see which genes could be associated with one stage or another. Uh, in this case, this particular stage had 762 genes that were associated with uh, the 10 hour or the 12 hour embryo, and worms had 363 genes associated with the dower. And then she looked to see how many of those were shared between the two sets. Uh, here it's 107. And then used the hypergeometric distribution to determine the significance of that. How, how likely would you get this number by chance? Importantly, there, she uh, applied a Bonferroni correction because this is a 36 by 30 array. Uh, she basically in increased the p-value by three orders of magnitude and still got very highly significant values. I want to take, come back to this one then and look at this a little harder. And I want to point out uh, these two regions. And, and we didn't see this, if, if you remember, on the fly uh, against fly. But when we look worm against fly, we actually see uh, genes in late that are, are associated with late embryo uh, also uh, appear in the pupae. And what we think is going on is that there are genes, now remember these are orthologs, not just one-to-one -one orthologs, but many-to-one and one-to-many. And what we think is going on here is that uh, Fly has taken a bunch of genes that are important in this aspect of development, duplicated them, uh, and so when we use worms, they have a, a single copy and we can see both copies when we look at, against Fly. Uh, and so it says that this, uh, this element, uh, looks like there are, there are indeed expression patterns that are shared uh, uh, with orthologs, and indeed uh, they may be uh, reiterated in development here, something we, we did not see by itself. Okay, so uh, Mark mentioned that you can take uh, histone marks and correlate that with uh, transcription levels and do very nice uh, predictions of of uh, gene expression, uh, and not just in worm, where they started, but with uh, human and in fly. Uh, and so we're, we're now at a stage in the, in the project where we're getting a lot more data. Uh, Mike Snyder tomorrow is going to tell you about uh, the, the data on 110 transcription factors. Uh, but we, were, we would like to be able to get uh, still other kinds of uh, expression data that would limit, would limit the kinds of uh, hypotheses that you could make and see if there would be even stronger predictions that could be made from it. So one of the avenues that we pursued is with David Miller looking at individual cells 
This is an example of two neurons from the pharynx. That's, so what we're sorting on are just the two NSM neurosecretory uh, cells in the, in the pharynx. Uh, and you, you can dissociate the worm with uh, STS and pronase treatment, end up with cells. Here are some examples of those. And if you sort on those and do an RNA-seq experiment and look for enrichment, these are the, the top uh, 10 genes that are enriched in this neurosecretory cell. This is a serotonergic cell. And uh, these are some of the uh, gene, genes that you would expect to be involved in those. And these are here. So MOD5, TPH1, uh, CAT1 are, are here. And these are, ex these are very highly enriched. Remember that these are two cells out of 1,000. Uh, and so this is about as much enrichment as we should expect. Uh, these are probably just because these genes are so hard to detect, uh, the signal is so low in the whole, in the whole L1 stage, uh, that the signal just, it's probably uh, noise. Anyway, so that's one approach. Uh, we're doing this on a variety of different cells. I think if we can do this on two cells, we probably can do it on one. Uh, and, uh, and so we should be able to get a uh, signal uh, one cell at a time if we can do it, if we can find the right labels. And the other uh, aspect that we're doing that we'd like to be able to bring to bear on this, uh, it's praying on my, oh, there it goes, is to look at movies. Uh, so we're using these uh, confocal movies uh, to see if we can uh, get gene expression at the single cell level. Each nucleus is labeled with histone GFP. And I don't know, this is about 28 cells or something. And then we, so these are confocal stacks. We take, a, we take a stack every minute and we're just showing you the movie. Uh, we don't ever actually look at, look at things this way. But in the same strain, uh, we have introduced a, a red fluorescent reporter, and you can see it coming on here, and, and labeling these other cells. Uh, and because the worm has a, a constant lineage, uh, and we can follow all this, and Jerong Bao and John Murray have done amazing work with all this, uh, the idea is that now we have a, a picture of what genes are, what cells are expressing this gene uh, at any moment. And I'll just go to the next slide. And basically what we can do, this is now the C. elegans lineage, not a cluster diagram. And, uh, and you can see the individual cells uh, expressing, these are, these are they here. Uh, and we know what lineage they came from, uh, we know the anatomy. And so the idea is can we begin to intersect this information uh, with, the, with the transcription factor information and other expression data that we've been getting from other things and, and begin to think about uh, how you can, uh, how all these things interact to create a regulatory network. And I'm gonna let Mike talk about that tomorrow. In the last couple minutes here, I just wanna uh, tell a story from uh, Eric Lai uh, and, and Sue Selnicker about three prime ends. Uh, and basically, when you, when you look at tissue-specific things, uh, expression patterns, uh, you see that the proximal poly A sites are used in the, in the testis. Uh, here, a, a medium poly A site is being used in the ovary, but if you look at the head, there's a very long uh, three prime UTR, in this case, 18 KB. Uh, and, and this is only really used in, in heads. And if uh, they went ahead and actually did northern analysis on these uh, to confirm that the heads were uh, for these different, uh, different genes uh, all had significantly elongated uh, three prime UTRs uh, compared to other body parts. Uh, and testis was generally uh, short. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but you get the picture. Uh, and they then also did in situ, where they took probes from uh, the whole message and compared it to the, the uh, probe from just the extended three prime UTR. 
And uh, these are all neuronal specific. Uh, these are showing different patterns. For instance, these spots here are gone here. So this is a, this is a, these are long UTRs uh, that are specifically used uh, in the nervous system. And uh, presumably, these are excellent targets for microRNA regulation. Uh, this just gives more of that uh, so that you get a picture of how long they are compared to the rest of things. And, and indeed, the longest uh, ones are, are way out here, and they're all neuronal specific. So, uh, so that's an unexpected uh, finding from all, from all this data. So I've told you that the worm and, gene, worm and fly genomes uh, are, the annotations are much more complete. Uh, they're much more accurate. And unfortunately for the worm investigators, they're much more complex. Uh, the worm and fly stages uh, do share common stage associated genes. And, and we're anxious to see if we could possibly uh, correlate this with mouse. Uh, human is going to be another challenge. Uh, but, but do these same sets of genes, are they echoed in mouse embryogenesis? Um, we hope that the expression data combined with other mod encode data uh, can begin to predict expression in a serious way. And then I, I ended with uh, this little vignette about neural specific alternative polyadenylation and long UTRs. And as everybody else has done, we have a long list of collaborators. This is the people on the worm uh, transcriptome project. Uh, these are the people involved in the, in the fly. Uh, and I think that's it for now. Thanks. Bob, right, oh, do you want, go ahead. Go, go first. <laughs> On your left. Great presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, I mean, it, it was pretty striking to see these dis dif different lineages from worm coming up, I mean, the gene expression coming on in all those different lineages at the same time. Yep. So the, the, the obvious question is, is it some extracellular signaling that sort of sends a message to each of these cells and they're all responding? Or is it that each of them is programmed to independently come on at exactly the same time, creating this resulting sort of uniform structure? So, so that was that particular example. Uh, Susan can talk more about FA4. Uh, uh, we, we certainly see other transcription factors that come on over different times in different lineages. Uh, for, the, for FA4, I think that's thought to be cell autonomous, and, and so these should just be all coming on. Is that fair? Okay, so a little bit of both, basically. A little bit of both? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fa fascinating stuff, though. It's an interesting lineage. Wow. Thanks. Ben. Hey, Bob. Two things. One, I just wanted to credit Nathan Boley, who is here today, for the fly annotation. It never, ever okay. would have happened without him. Must thank Nathan. Uh, and two, sorry, Nathan. Two is uh, with the cell sorting, um, is, is there concern about uh, RNA degradation during the sorting process? I mean, how, how fast are you treating with uh, RNA inhibitors? So that, all, all of these are concerns. I mean, uh, the, the cells are viable at the end of this process. You can plate them out and culture them. Uh -huh. uh, we, don't, we don't do that. We take them and harvest them. But it's true that the cells are dissociated yeah. uh, and then put through a fax machine, unfortunately, room temperature. Uh, and all this takes time. They're, they're then plunged immediately into, uh, into trizol so that, so that while they're alive, uh, we don't, know what, we don't know what's going on. So, but, so that, but we are at least encouraged that among the things that are there, uh, they make sense. So have you tried doing a time course where you literally just sort slower, do things slower, and, and see if you get big changes? That would be a good idea. Bob, I was um, struck by the uh, low exon count in the Drosophila genes and wondering if you think that relates to uh, the low repeat density in the euchromatic arms. We have noticed that the fourth chromosome genes where we have a 30% repeat density, 
have an average of six exons compared to an average of three exons in the euchromatic arms? Huh. I don't know. Nathan or Ben, you want to? That was the slide you sent me yesterday. <laughs> so we have very rapid evolution here. <laughs> Is that right? I put the wrong one on the bar chart? I thought I got it off your slide. OK. One last very quick question. Sean. Uh, Bob, I really appreciated in particular the, the, the color, co color development. It's very nice. Is that from your lab or from Fabio? No, no, the, the development is all from the, the movies and yes, so forth? Yes, yes. Oh, no, that's from my, John Murray is in the audience. He, took, he probably took that movie. Very beautiful. Then yeah. I have a question, OK? With exactly the same method, we have been annotating for 10 years 50,000 genes in human and about 20,000 in worm. So we always had this big factor. Now, are you sure that you are counting 20, 20 and 15 with exactly the same method? So uh, as I said, we, when, we, when we compare worm and human and fly, we are using different methods. Uh -huh. we're, we're, we're using the data as best we can. Uh, and so GenCode, you know, you know, they do a, this is a, a combination of manual annotation and, uh, and ensemble. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to try to dig deep into this and see what we can come up with. OK, thank you. OK.